Hello, Gian. Pleasure to be here. What a pleasure it is to have you here. Thank I you. feel like I know you. Your show's on in our household every day. I think my wife, Deb, is your most ardent fan. Well, that's very kind. Thank you very much. I'm thrilled to know that you've heard what I do. I want to talk about Gilda Radner and the Gilders Club uh, benefit in a minute. But, for, but first, you, you were awarded the country's highest civilian honor, the Order of Canada, earlier this month. I know it's never easy reflecting on what an honor like that means, but you've, you've had a few weeks. What do you think? Well, I, to be honest, uh, I, I still quite, you know, can't believe it. Um, uh, I can't, you know, it, 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 you can't make any kind of, you know, rhyme or reason out of it. I, I, uh, it was, and to play it down is kind of, um, I, I mean, I can't do that. You, 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 you wish you could be kind of blasé a little bit. I mean, you don't wish you could be blasé, but I mean, you, you, you don't like to kind of, you feel like, uh, when people t talk to you about what a great day it was, it, you know, you want to kind of pat yourself on the back and say, well, sure. gee, this is really, but it was truly, I would say, you know, next to, uh, my uh, my wedding day and the the birth of my kids probably the greatest um, day you know of of my life. It is quite an honor. You don't realize what an honor it is until you're actually there, mm. and you're there in the company of some pretty amazing Canadians uh, in their field who have just done remarkable work. And you know, as I said to the Governor General when he was putting the medal around my neck, I said, I feel more like the court jester than part of the royalty in the room. But, um... Uh, you actually said that to the... Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I did. Because some of these people have, uh, you know, you, amazing accomplishments and... And to be, you know, to be uh, going down as one of the great, you know, nerdy character guys. and <laughs> You've worked really hard. I mean, there is a time and a place to pat yourself on the back, isn't there? Well, you know, I, 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 guess, I guess there is, you know. It's just, it, honestly, it's just not in my nature to do that. I mean, everybody goes out and does the best job, you know, they can do at whatever it is they do. And if you do that, you go home and feel like you deserve a nice dinner. I mean, you know, you... <laughs> You've done you've done the best you can do. So, um, and, but honestly, I guess to have people recognize it in such a major way, yeah. like receiving the Order of Canada, um, I would never have guessed it when I you know dropped out of McMaster uh, back in 1970. But um, you know, there we go. You're suggesting to find the kind of success that you've had. It's it's best to drop out of McMaster. <laughs> no, I'm not advising that <laughs> right. at all. But I, I feel uh, very kind of awkward about it when I'm asked to give you know a valedictory address. At, uh, <laughs> right, you right. know, well, you made the best of your time there, clearly, and then took that to, uh, to the I had races. a ball. I had a ball <laughs> at McMaster. I, uh, let me start here with the, with the the Gilda's Club benefit. I mentioned you're appearing at this. It's it's called It's Always Something here in Toronto, November 19th. G Gilda yeah. was a legendary performer who died of cancer in 1989. What what is it about her? Her spirit that continues to bring together such an all-star cast of comedians. This year again, Martin Short, Catherine O'Hara, Russell Peters, Fred Willard, yourself. Yeah, Andrea Martin, Lighthouse. You know, Andy Kim. Yeah. Uh, uh, it, it, it's 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 going to be the best show they've had in ten years. So, w w what is it? Well, I guess not everybody involved with the show uh, got to meet Gilda or work with her. A bunch of us did. Certainly, Marty, Paul Schaefer. Andrea Martin, myself, Catherine O'Hara, we all got to work with uh, Gilda. In fact, Catherine replaced Gilda when, when, when we were in Second City together. It was Catherine O'Hara who actually replaced Gilda when Gilda went on to do the uh, National Lampoon mm. uh, shows that eventually led to her Saturday Night Live thing. She was just a vibrant spirit. She was an amazing talent. Uh and and uh, always uh, always just kind of a vibrant positive spirit and if you read uh, her book uh, it's always something um, you re you 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 realize that during the uh, her most painful period when she was going through her you know cancer her 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 vibe was still very 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 positive hmm. you know T t take me back, speaking of those early years when you got a chance to, to work with Gilda Radner, take, take me back to your first performances. Even in those first SCTV shows, you, you're a master at creating very funny original characters, you know, Earl Camber, uh, Bobby Bittman, doing impressions. Mm -hmm. What started you creating mm -hmm. characters in the first place? 
Um, well, I I don't know honestly. That's a good question. Uh, I, I, I don't know if I have an answer for that. Probably it's because uh, the thought of actually going out there as yourself was just far too scary. So you you know you 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 have a lot more confidence, kind of putting yourself out there as somebody else. Were you doing characters or impressions as a kid? Is that what? No, you... no, 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 no. I was kind of a quiet kid. In fact, my my foray into comedy started really just writing goofy little things in 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 high school. You know, just uh, uh, and I, I still have that <laughs> Hillroy notebook that I titled. Uh, Poetry, pros and cons, <laughs> um, and um, and so I started writing these goofy little things, and then it kind of caught on at the school, and then you know they got published in the paper, and then I ran for president of the student council and got voted in, and it was all based on these kind of, and that was really uh, the start of of you know my comedy uh, roots in terms of performing. I started singing in a singing group and that's the first time I got up in front of people to to do that but but character work no I never did impressions in fact when we started SCTV I was the I was the weak link in the group in terms of you know impressions hmm. Joe Flaherty did amazing impressions you know Peter O'Toole Gregory Peck unbelievable Dave Thomas did a, 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 a hysterical Richard Harris uh, um, Every, Catherine O'Hara did uh, Catherine Hepper. Everybody did impressions, and I, I couldn't. Well, and, but well, Errol Cannonbear was something of an impression, wasn't it? No, Based Errol on... Cannonbear was was uh, was not really an impression. It was like an amalgam of uh, characters, <laughs> right. probably modeled after a Buffalo newscaster for the most part, <laughs> right, Irv right. Weinstein. Right, 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 right. Um, uh, but it it the name came from you know I think it was Earl Cameron. Was a newscaster yes. on CBC many years ago, yes. um, and I think that's where I got kind of the the name and kind of cheesed it up a little bit by uh, turning the last name into Cannon Bear. But it, it really wasn't an impression; it really was a you know a a character. And I found that that is where my my comedy started to you know come out right. doing these characters. You when you it, were at McMaster. Um, this is in the late 60s in Hamilton. This is where you meet up with people like Ivan Reitman, Martin Short, Dave Thomas. Looking back, that's an incredible amount of talent there. What was going on? Uh, why? Well, I, I, I don't know why. Um, it was, I think, the early 70s generally, there was a, just a glut of talent in the in the area, certainly at McMaster. I mean, I met Mar I met Marty Short at McMaster in uh, uh, doing a play that was written by Dave Thomas and his brother hmm. Ian back then, a musical version of Frankenstein. That's the first time I actually uh, met Marty, and then and then we became very 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 good friends. Uh, Ivan uh, Reitman, I, I got to know there at the McMaster Film Board. We started making films together. You know, I made the first talkie. At McMaster in 1968, the first movie with sync sound, um, and uh, Danny Goldberg. Um, uh, yeah, it, it was a very, very creative very uh, time yeah. back then. And even when I got to Toronto in the early 70s, uh, and 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 uh, you know met the the likes of uh, Dan Aykroyd and John Candy when we when we went into audition for Second City, again, an amazing. Uh, uh, amazing group of talented uh, people that we that we we, we kind of worked with, you know, during during that time period. And you you end up in that a uh, few years after university in that landmark production of Godspell that we've heard so much about. It's almost mythical at this point from nineteen nineteen seventy two. This is alongside Gilda and uh, Andrea Martin and Martin Short and Dave yeah. Thomas and Victor Garber, right? Right, and we were all there for the opening of Godspell on Broadway this past. That's right. Monday, yeah. for 40 years later, it's uh, now back on Broadway, and I thought it was a, just a dazzling production. And Victor was there, Andrea, myself, Marty, and Paul Schaefer, five, uh, five uh, remnants of the old Toronto production. 
Then in 76, Eugene, when SCTV hits the airwaves in Canada, this is a year after SNL has begun. You must have been watching that show at the time. Was was the SCTV cast trying to outdo Saturday Night Live in some way? No, the, the reason our show started was because the, 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 the guy who, who owned Second City, Bernie Solins, uh, said that he, you know, when SNL opened in 1975, you know, half the half the uh, the cast, half the comedy contingent in SNL was was Second City. The other half seemed to be National Lampoon. That was the, those were the two main groups that formed that creative nucleus mm. there. And um, and so Bernie said, uh, well, they've just uh, got a TV show going with all our Second City people, and wh- wh- why don't we get a TV show going up here with with our Second City people? And that was that was really the spark that started the discussion that led to the. Uh, the uh, the format, you know, to the show, we, we a bunch of us kind of got together and just brainstormed what the show would be, and and a year later we started out as a local show in Toronto. It was it was only a Toronto show, I think, um, uh, and and then uh, and then and and we didn't all we did was you know we went in we would go to work. It was kind of an odd thing because we weren't TV writers, we didn't know anything about it. We came out of the theater, so we would create our comedy by kind of doing improvisational exercises, you know, like, uh, and then we would try and improvise, you know, scenes until we realized that, you know, if you're doing a weekly television show, it's a much, it, it's it's just too time consuming a way to, right. to write. We just can't get it. It would take all day to come up with a germ of an idea that might turn into one scene. And so we learned eventually to break up into smaller groups and actually, you know, put pen to paper. Um, and uh, but we didn't know anybody was watching the show. We had no idea. We were writing for ourselves. You know, we would do the show, go home and have dinner, and that was it. Had no idea anybody was actually watching the show. Well, people were watching, and and it becomes a massive success, of course. And many of the your SCTV castmates uh, uh, become major stars. And you know, I'm thinking of John Candy, Rick Moranis, uh, Martin Short. Mm-hmm. Tell me about your decision to forego going to L.A. when some of the others did so. Well, we um, we had I think when when we uh, realized that uh, we were going to have kids when my uh, my wife uh, uh, got pregnant with our with uh, uh, my my son Daniel, we made a decision to uh, go back to Toronto to raise the kids in in Toronto because uh, you know there was a in Los Angeles it was kind of a you know it's a weird thing you're you're in a very show busy kind of community and that's good in a way but when you think about your kids growing up in a very show busy community you're thinking well are we putting kind of walls around them in terms of what they might end up doing um it's kind of a it's it's very kind of insular and and you know a a not claustrophobic but that that is your world it's Mm. a show business kind of world so how are they going to grow up and and entertain the uh, the prospect of possibly being a doctor or a lawyer or so we went back to Toronto and uh, where we thought the city was just as a city a much better city a cleaner city a safer city great public transit they can take the subway when they're 12 and 13 and 14 years old instead of you know being driven around in Los Angeles like kids were until they were 16 and got their own license there's no way to get around there um uh, nobody takes the bus, so so that was the decision. We came back to Toronto, and I, um, I, I certainly don't regret it. It made things a lot more difficult to kind of be a part of the entertainment scene uh, when you're in Toronto, because out of sight, out of mind. You're you know when you're away, you're away. So I did manage to uh, get some uh, some jobs uh, down there over the next you know, a few years, but primarily had to start creating a work uh, scene in Toronto where I could, um, 
you know, stay busy and make money. One of the jobs that you do get, um, uh, I'll try not to gush too much here because I'm such a fan of these films, but in the mid-90s, you and Christopher Guest uh, become writing partners, and together you write Waiting for Guffman, Best in Show, A Mighty Wind, which also scores you a Grammy Award. It all begins when he phones you up kind of out of the blue. I mean, you, you didn't know him, right? And, and, and he, did you ever find out why he approached you, and how did you know that you had this chemistry when you immediately? Well, I didn't. I didn't. In fact, uh, in, in the beginning, I thought he was a really uh, odd duck. I thought he was just a, a really odd fellow and very difficult to kind of, you know, get to get to know. I'd met him a couple of times. I was a huge fan of of Chris's from the from the old uh, National Lampoon days mm. when I would listen to those records in the radio show and and just I was in awe of this this guy who did these great characters and had this amazing voice. Um and so when I finally did meet him, I was going, ah, oh, this is Chris Guest. Wow, this is great. But he was he was kind of tough to get to know and and a little kind of off-putting in a way. Like, you know, he would come out with comments that you couldn't quite understand, and you're going, what is he putting me on? Is he, you know, I don't, I don't quite get this. So when he finally called me in Toronto in uh, 1996 and and said, hi, it's Christopher Guest, and I, uh, I'm just I'm thinking of an idea for a movie and want, wanted to know if you wanted to come down and write it with me. And my heart was just palpitating at that point because I'm, I'm thinking, wow, I, I'm not even sure I like this guy at this point. And, and, and working with him, in a, he said, yeah, I've got a little cabin up, up in the northwest and we could go up there for 10 days. And I'm thinking, oh, my God. <laughs> Ten days in a cabin with us. I don't know. And then I thought, well, right. what's the worst? What's the worst case scenario? The worst case scenario is I I I I, I fly there. I have a terrible day. I tell him this is not going to work, and and I fly home. So I said yes. But from the time he picked me up at the airport, from the time that very first day, we we immediately hit it off, and there was just uh, I guess a side to him. Um, and I think it's just there's a the, he's he's more comfort I, I, when he's more comfortable with somebody I, I don't know what the reason is but he we laughed all day long yeah and we immediately started to develop a great working uh, relationship in terms of why he called me in the first place I never found out until 10 years later I always assumed he called about 10 other people that he actually knew he didn't know me hmm. uh, and they all said no I'm busy I'm busy I'm busy and somebody recommended why don't you call Eugene Levy so, but I asked him 10 years later, why did you call me that day 10 years ago? And he said, well, I was, I, I loved your television show. And in particular, I loved you on the show and thought the chemistry would be right uh, with, with the two of us. And I said, wow, I'm so sorry I didn't ask that when I first met you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, I, here I got a minute left uh, in this, this segment. Uh, there's, I've, there's about twenty questions I want to ask you. I wanted to ask you about the Amer American Pie series, which has really made you more famous than than ever for all the range of roles and success that you've yeah. had. Um, and I know you're continuing with that. I, I guess for a long time in your career, maybe you didn't get the the kind of respect and recognition that that one feels that you should. Does it feel good to get it now? Oh, I, I, As listen, a character I, actor? I've, I've always felt I've had a, an amazing career. I've never, I've never had to take an outside job, you know, ever in my career. And that to me is a, a you know, a sign that you, you've been doing okay. I always felt my career was successful even before, uh, American Pie, but American Pie certainly, you know, kind of kicked me up into another, uh, another echelon and I'll be forever grateful, you know, for that. And, uh, um, just an amazing string of movies. Another one coming out in April, the uh, big reunion movie, which is going to be great. But um, I just want to make sure that people who, if you're interested in seeing It's Always Something, www.itsalwayssomething.ca. Uh, there's not a lot of tickets left, so... Eugene Levy. Okay. Th thank you for this. Thanks, Jan.